All right. Hey, y'all. It's Barry. Uh, I'm here to talk about AP Physics Unit 5, Circular Kinematics and Dynamics. I'm going to do a quick summary here uh, of the whole unit. So we're going to roll through things quickly, and I'm going to get right to it. Uh, first thing we have to do here is make this uh, shift in our minds from moving in a straight line to moving in a circular path. And you see right here we have our runners going in a straight line there. Well, we're going to make that shift as if they're running in a circle now. So a couple things about this. The action is the same. Forces are still required. Motion is still happening. We're still covering some distance in some amount of time. It's just the path that we're going to look at a little bit differently. All right. So we're going to have to make a little bit of a shift here. But what you've learned as far as kinematics and dynamics and momentum and energy and all of this still holds true. OK, all we have to do is look at it a little bit differently in order to make that shift. We're going to change some of our kinematic units and our quantities here. So where we had a magnitude and direction for a velocity vector and thus some um, change in position that you're covering over a time there and a potential acceleration with that. Well, now we're just doing that as we move around this circle here. OK, so we still have a velocity that would just be a tangential velocity in this case, but we're going to bring the radius into all of these things. And so in order to make the shift that we need to make, um, we need to turn our, our distance that we would cover into a change in the angle that we've spun around in a circle here. We need to change our velocity to an angular velocity, which is to say how quick are you spinning as opposed to how fast are you moving forward or backwards. Okay, And then we could still have an acceleration. You can still spin faster. It's just going to be an angular acceleration at this point. Now, again, everything we've learned so far still holds true. And so I want to look at these down here. These are our kinematic equations. And you see that we've made this shift between them, but the rest is still there and still works. So what was velocity is now angular velocity. What was acceleration is now angular acceleration and so forth and so on. For all of these items, it still all works. OK, and you notice here the factor of radius is what is co um, connecting all of these things. That's what's going on. Again, it's just how far you are from the center point as you're moving around it. That's going to be our correlation between our circular motion and our uh, linear motion. Um, so beyond that, we need to talk about what holds something moving in a circle, and that's known as a centripetal force. Now, there's a lot of different types of centripetal forces. Um, a centripetal force really is just something that keeps you moving in a circular pattern. Depending on the example, it could be a lot of different things. So we have someone here tossing um, a ball around here from the end of a, a string, and in this case, the centripetal force that's holding this in a circular pattern would be the tension in this string or in this, this wire, whatever this is right here, okay? But in the case of this car moving around the circular path, it's just going to be the friction between the tires of the car and the road. Both of those would be considered the centripetal force in their own individual cases because they keep that object moving in a circular pattern. Now down here, we have a roller coaster. In that case, there it would just be that connection, um, that, that tension type force. Um, I don't know if tension is probably the right word, but whatever we would consider that force between the, the locked on wheels and the actual track, that would be our, um, our centripetal force in that case. And in the case here of Earth moving around the sun, it's going to be gravitation. And these are all forces you know and have calculated in the past. But in this, these cases here, we're going to consider those to be the centripetal force because they are what keeps something moving in a circular pattern. Now, in order to have this, we need to have an acceleration for there to be this force here because force is mass times acceleration. There can, this can all happen without a change in velocity of the object that's moving in a circular path. Now, remember, acceleration is defined as a change in velocity. Velocity is defined as having both a direction and a magnitude. Well, if the magnitude doesn't change but the direction does change, we still have an acceleration. And this is known as a centripetal acceleration. That's what you're looking at right here. In order to put some sort of magnitude, some sort of numeric value to this, we can't just consider the change in velocity because the velocity is constant. But because it's always moving in this circular path, we can consider the velocity and the radius to be a fair measure of that acceleration. So the centripetal acceleration is going to be the velocity squared. This is the tangential velocity squared divided by the radius. And thus, F equals MA becomes F equals M. This centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, and so we get mv squared over r for our centripetal force. And this would be equal to, in all these cases, the force of the tension here, the force of the friction here, the force holding the roller coaster onto the track here, the gravitational force here. That's going to be that work as the same value for all of those different um, um, circumstances. 
Um, some uh, more examples here. Again, we see this car going around the track, and this shows a little more specifically exactly what's going on. So I wanted to focus a little closer on some of this stuff. But uh, we've got the tension in the string there as the string is going. And a good way to think about this is if this string was cut, this object is going to move on this path A here um, straight out tangentially, right? If friction went away here, if, if there was a case where you hit an icy patch in the road, you can slide out on the road. That's why that happens. Your friction goes away, okay? And you see as this roller coaster moves through here, all of these forces acting in towards the center that are keeping it moving along there. Um, centrifugal forces are a little bit different. Um, to be fair, they're basically the opposite, okay? Now, first, centrifugal forces are not a real thing. OK, there is no actual force that's happening there. It's a sensation based on the inertial desire to continue along a path. Now, remember, Newton's first law says objects in motion tend to stay in motion. This accounts for that feeling of a force that you might have in the car as you go around a curve. You feel like you're moving to the outside of the curve, even though the car is being pulled to the inside by the centripetal force. That happens because your inertia wants to continue along that tangential line as it's moving around the curve there. And so it wants to continue right here. And so you feel like you're being pushed to the outside as the equal and opposite force to this. There's no actual force acting on you. It's just your inertia's desire to continue to do that and move outwards. Okay. Um, next, we need to talk about inertia versus mass. So, so far, we've looked at objects that are linearly traveling from basically the perspective of a dot, right? A point in space. And so if we look at this axe as if it was this point, we would just say, okay, it moves to the right. But if this axe was actually thrown, then it would not just move to the right, but it would spin around some central point as well, right? Both of those things are going to affect its motion overall. So now that we've moved from just linear motion to circular and rotational motion as well, we need to consider that. All right, now if we looked at just the mass as it was traveling, um, and we treated this object just as a point as we just talked about, then we would just use the mass in kilograms to describe how it travels, F equals MA, right? Um, but when we consider an object that rotates, we need to think about the actual inertia of it and how it spins about this center point, because it's not always necessarily going to do so um, perfectly spaced around that point. So we need to consider the inertia of the object, and that will be the mass times the radius squared, and that will be the radius from this central point. So we could take like the middle of this metal piece and say this distance here. The mass of it times that radius squared. Well, then we've got this handle. Well, the handle center is going to be down here. So we would take the mass of the handle times that radius squared. And put those together, that would give us an inertial value that would better describe how this would move through space. Um, so when we have objects that rotate around the, something, so let's say we have an object that's just spinning. Okay. Well, that object has mass outside of the axis about which it's spinning. Right. So if we have just an object moving, its inertia is going to be MR squared. Right. But if we have a lot of them, we're going to add all those together. And if we have an odd space here, then we would need to get into some calculus in order to determine where those are. So we're not doing this in AP Physics 1, but just so you have an idea, odd shaped objects, this can be considered for as well. But if we have an object such as this here spinning around this point, well, we need to consider then how the mass that's about the axis here is distributed in order to properly describe the inertia. And because that's going to be different than let's say this hollow ring or this solid sphere, right? Or the same object here as here, but rotating about a different axis. This one would be rotating about the axis right through the center there. This one would have it spinning so that the ends would go round and round and round, okay? In those cases, we're going to need to have these inertial equations in order to determine what the inertia of that specific shape is, all right? Um, you'll, you won't be asked to memorize those. You'll be given those if you need them. But realize that that is just for a solidly, um, a, a defined shape object rotating about a specific axis. Now here, if we have an axis of rotation right here, this is a great example, I think, and we have a rod with length L and then a sphere with radius R here at the end. If we wanted to spin this around this axis over and over and over again, we could consider the inertia here by looking at all of the different parts here put together, okay? And so we'd be looking at how the rod spins around that axis with the radius there, and then the sphere is doing the same thing, right? And we're going to look at how it spins around and then consider the distance that's there as well. 
Okay, um, we need to also talk about then kinetic energy and angular momentum. And really, these are going to, again, be the same type ideas as they are rotating around as what we've done before with kinetic energy and angular momentum. They're just going to do it in a circular pattern. And so you see a little bit here about how there's the spinning. But one, what was one half mv squared? Well, mass has become inertia and velocity has become rotational or circular velocity, right? So we're plugging those values in and having a new kinetic energy equation. And if you look, these match up. We're just making that transfer of, of quantities that we talked about already. To find the total kinetic energy, we're going to need both of those. And that goes back kind of to the ax here, right? This we would consider just the one half mv squared kinetic energy, but now we need to consider that rotation along with how it's flying through the air. All right, so we would consider both of those values now. And you see the an example here real quick for a rolling solid disk that would have a defined inertia as well. So it would be one half mr squared for its inertia there. Now, angular momentum, this would be uh, something that you've seen if you've ever watched figure skating or something like that when people's arms come in and out um, and they change how quickly they spin. Well, that's exactly what's going on. They're changing their inertia. They're bringing their mass more towards the center and thus increasing because they're decreasing their inertia. They're increasing their angular velocity. And that's really what we're looking at here. So what was mass times velocity is now inertia times angular velocity. Okay. And so we just have that correlation there as well. Um, now to look at torque. Torque is a force applied some distance from a point that causes this rotation. All right. So if we have a pivot point right here and some sort of bar to it, if I apply a force at some distance, then this bar is now going to spin around this pivot point. Right. So if I have a force applied to a moment arm here, something that can move a door, let's say right there, then it's going to have a motion that's going to go in that circular path that you see right there outwards. And that's why this all connects. This is known as rotational motion. It's when a force is applied to create this circular motion. Here we have torque then. And it's going to be the distance that this force is applied times the force. And so it will be me measured in newtons times meters. There's no new unit here for torque. There's a lot of examples of this in the real world. Um, the most classic one is just something like a wrench where you hold on to it at some point here and apply a force at some distance from the center and thus it causes a torque around the centerpiece and loosens or tightens whatever nut you're trying to put in there, right? Um, less easier to see, I think, are, are these things when the force of gravity is what's causing a lot of this. So we have our classic leaning ladder where we would have uh, some amount of forces here at the bottom that keep it from sliding out or falling down through the ground, and then a force here from the wall that's a support force and a weight of maybe an object on it and the weight of the ladder. All of these forces up here would cause some sort of rotation about this center point, and so we could consider that as torques as well. And the same thing is true here for a supported beam. We'd have a rotational point right here where tension's holding it up, but gravity is trying to pull it down. And so the combination of a torque in this direction from from starting from the bottom and going up for the tension and starting up here and going down for the weight right there would create some sort of torque about this beam and could cause rotation about this. As in, if the tension's not strong enough, then the weight will pull this down. So I hope that's a good summary. I hope that's helpful. Have a good one.